The word why, what a curious word. The kind of word that can make us cringe, feel defensive, or even distant. But you know, sometimes why is the key. The key that can unlock so much to our lives. Join me as we explore the why with fascinating contributors to the world. Those that entertain us, inform us, teach us about life, and if we're lucky, inspire the next in all of us. I'm your host, Dr. Rod Berger, and welcome to Headroom, a production of Rainlight and co-produced by Old Soul. Let's go. Okay, so I think this is really important. You know, when I think about negotiation, I think about my children. I think about the ways in which they're going to navigate the world, having both a boy and a girl, uh, how mm-hmm. that may be different, how that may be experienced differently, whether or not it should be. Um, And I wanted to talk to somebody who's in the space and has been doing some great work. And so I think that that's going to really benefit our conversation today. I want to introduce you to Cindy Watson. She's the founder of Women on Purpose and creator of the Art of Feminine Negotiation and Persuasion Programs. She's also the founder and managing partner of Watson Palmer Law as an attorney specializing in social justice law for 30 years. She is a TEDx international speaker, Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestselling and award-winning author, master negotiator and negotiation coach and consultant known for her passion, commitment, and ability to inspire. As a world-class women's empowerment coach and consultant, Cindy has a proven track record empowering, advocating, and motivating people to rediscover their purpose and become the best version of themselves so they can negotiate their best life. Okay, Cindy, I'm going (laughs) to, do I give you a softball question? Let's start with this. I think when people think about negotiation, the first thing that comes to their mind, whether it's sort of glibly or not, would be around the relationships that they're in. (laughs) And they think that the negotiation between themselves and their partner, their spouse, even with their children as their children sort of grow. Can you walk me down sort of the path of where negotiation, sort of the pillars start? And are we, in essence, aware of some of those pillars as they start to grow and develop? Yeah. Well, I love that question. It's funny because it's probably, it's interestingly not a softball to the extent I I would have thought it is because I'm a big believer that all of life is a negotiation, right? I mean, whether it just, as you've said, Rod, whether we're negotiating with our kids, with our intimate partner, with service providers, you know, with banks, insurance companies, and yes, in the boardroom, multi-million dollar deals. But most people, uh, when you say the word negotiation, immediately picture a boardroom in power suits, right? You know, the big, yeah. <laughs> big shoulders. And I actually surprisingly get a lot of pushback when I characterize your relationship with your kids or intimate partners or friends or family, extended family as a negotiation. People get their feathers quite ruffled about that. So, uh, so I love the question. And, and I guess the starting point I would say is, I'm on a mission to help people reframe and recognize that all of life is a negotiation because when you show up with that intention, you show up differently, right? You prepare differently. You think more deeply. uh, You consider who you want to be in the interaction as opposed to often with our family member and our personal relationships, we're in a very reactive mode and we're just winging it and we're not preparing for these difficult discussions, which is why they often go sideways. (laughs) Sydney, okay, so a question then. I think of it a little bit like a threshold that someone has to cross and whether that is earlier in their life or sort of later on in life, at that point when they feel it's almost like it's a a value proposition, like an internal, a a self sort of reflecting value proposition that says, I am valuable enough to be able to negotiate and and create a sense of agency. And yet there, there seems to be, and maybe it is culturally based. I want to, we'll keep this to our country here in the U S but where that sort of that fork in the road comes, where we decide that, you know, we, we can communicate our position. And do you find that it does sort of you know, does it, does it get down to that sort of baseline of whether or not you feel confident in yourself to communicate your position? Because I find that people who are really good at negotiating are incredibly confident. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because people confuse, I think, assertive with aggressive. And it's one of the problems. And and I wish we were taught this in elementary school because it starts that early. And one of the things I say, it's not even just that threshold question. I'd go a step further and say, We Our first and most important negotiation is negotiating our mindset. And we need to do that every day. You know, uh, when we wake up in the morning, uh, before every difficult conversation, when we're uh, looking to start a new relationship or a a business encounter, um, it's really critical to dig in and negotiate our own mindset. 
you know, whether we value ourselves, whether we believe in ourselves, what we want, who do we want to show up as, all of those questions involve negotiating our mindset. And and the problem, I think, comes around because everything we've been taught about negotiate, to the extent that we're taught at all, I guess I should say. Yeah, fair point. Um, <laughs> most of it is based on myths about what it means to negotiate. And I think it's one of the reasons the world's so out of balance today. So it, would you, I'm, I would imagine this is sort of rhetorical, but that it is the art of nego the, the negotiation itself. It's not about command and control over another human being or circumstance, but that seems to be how it plays out, whether that's TV, movies, yeah. just that social experiment that we have, <laughs> even in the, uh, on the athletic field, right? I mean, yeah. we see that in activities. We see that at, in our hobbies as adults. Um, is that fair? I mean, is that, I'm thinking oh, that's yeah, a I, I'm laughing because you're you're speaking my language for sure. <laughs> and I speak about this often. I, I do think we are sadly have been increasingly getting um sort of conditioned to worship at the altar of power. And we, I mean, most conflict arises from a sense of powerlessness, right? And and the problem is when we're all the conditioning we're getting, whether it's from our TV, our entertainment, uh, the little that we're taught about or read about negotiations is about exerting power over others, exerting control over others, as opposed to power with, uh, you know, the power of collaboration, the power of creation, the power of coming from a place of service. These are much more valuable and elegant and constructive ways to come to any bargaining table, whether personally or professionally, to get better outcomes. Um, but where, where does personality style, Cindy, fit into that? Because I think that maybe we maybe we're starting off sort of opening the wrong door because we have this sense that you have to be an extrovert to be able to yeah. communicate and sort of stand your ground. There's sort of this firmness that feels like you have to you have to be rooted in yeah. your position, especially <laughs> these days. Um, yeah. But if that's you know, if that was the premise, uh, well, then we'd be wiping out sort of half of the population just in a rudimentary yeah. sense to say those that are not extroverted, you know, how do we and do we put value on that over someone who yeah. is maybe much more poised and calm yeah. and cautious and thoughtful about the way in which they communicate with others? Yeah. And I, and I think we have been doing that. And I think it's, again, one of those problems and the reason we're so kicked out of balance because, and it's ironic, I, I wrote a piece about introverts and that introverts actually demonstrate exceptional negotiation skills typically because they tend to be more thoughtful, a little less reactive. They, they think before they speak, they're much more likely to prepare. They're much more likely to listen, truly listen, which we are terrible at in North America. And, wow. and as a result of that, are I'm, I'm more likely to come up with with deeper insights that will lead to more collaborative, better outcomes for everyone. But there is no question, we are a very extrovert-driven society now. We celebrate extroverts. And in the boardroom, in the business world in particular, we uh, prom are much more likely to promote extroverts. And I think we do that to our detriment, right? And and we also diminish what I I mean, the reason my book is called The Art of Feminine Negotiation, and I, which I had to think long and hard about because I knew there would be resistance to that concept. But I'm like, you know what, we need to call it out. I think we are, for the reasons we've been talking about, so conditioned to see those so-called soft skills, which most people see as feminine traits, um, as a liability. And so what happens when we see something as a liability, both men and women and all the spaces in between end up stifling it because we see it as a weakness. And, you know, my my mission is to get everybody, you know, both men and women, regardless that leave gender aside, let's lean into those so-called soft skills or feminine traits because that's where the gold is. That's where you're going to get those best outcomes. I'm so glad you brought that up. And we're going to do a deep dive in, in, the, in the, the feminine element of this um, and, and the book. But the irony, so the other day I, I moderated a panel uh, at a well-known school here in Nashville. And it was around artificial intelligence and entrepreneurism. Mm. And these young people asked some fantastic questions. And, and I kept thinking in my head around this, you know, how do we support this next generation, Cindy, if we yeah. don't incorporate in the, the skill of negotiation, the skill of poise and the value of poise when you are negotiating, right? And the power of agency and how to basically dispense that agency amongst others, in business situations, you know, uh, and, and that's a part I really struggle with because the flip side of that coin is mental health for entrepreneurs. Yes. Yeah. And it, it's like I, I, earlier this year, I had a chance to interview Magic Johnson and I asked him about, he's a fantastic okay. entrepreneur. And that was a question I asked him about, why are we not exploring mental health 
when it comes to entrepreneurs? And he said he'd never been asked that question. He went on, an, you know, this whole, we went down this entire path. And yeah. that to me is sort of a sad state of affairs that we're not exploring that because I think I have to feel good about sort of my, my constitution at that given point in yeah. time to be able to negotiate, to understand my place. And if we're now supporting young people to go into business for themselves, they're going to have to be negotiating from the word go. Yeah. No. <laughs> the well, downslide of that, right? So I'm just curious as to your reflection on that as an observation when we think about the ne ne next generation, both North America, Europe, and beyond. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, that's such a loaded question. I mean, we could talk for days about that. It, and it's sadly, it's a subject I think we pay a lot of lip service to, right? Where there's a lot of talk about talking about mental health, but we're not doing it in meaningful ways. We're being very superficial in the approach. And my hope, and maybe I'm being naive and just optimistic, but, you know, everybody talks about the impact of COVID and, you know, the great resignation. And I like to think of it as the great reset. And my hope is, I think people were so shaken to their core um, that they re-examined their lives in ways that maybe we haven't in a long time, re-examined how society works in a way that we haven't in a long time, reprioritized how we want to show up, how we ought to show up, both individually in our interpersonal dynamics, but also on the world scene. And I think that's something we haven't done in a very long time. And I saw this shift because I've been preaching about this for years now. And I saw a shift where the first time and again, regardless of whether we, I think people attributed it to gender um, improperly, but at the very least, I think there was the value of so-called feminine stock went up. Let's put it that way, where people were saying, we need to find a softer way to do things, a more collaborative way to do things because mental health is at an all-time low, you know, suicide rates, depression rates, uh, all-time highs. And you've touched on a very soft chord for me here because, you know, of my three kids, one was diagnosed with a very serious mental health issue during COVID and the others, but the other two are struggling as well. And, um, and, and I want to just circle back quickly to the impact of TV because I think you hit on something really important. And I'm dating myself here, but I think about growing up in sort of my generation where... The role models on TV, it was like the good guy always won, your word was your bond, and all of those kinds of expectations, right, whether in Disney or beyond. And now if you look most of the key uh, TV shows that we're watching or the movies that we're, we're watching, somewhere along the way, the protagonist has actually become the anti-heroes. We're, we're almost always rooting for the so-called bad guy, right? You know, whether it's you think of Breaking Bad or Sopranos probably kickstarted that trend. <laughs> and Ray Donovan and all that. And every once in a while, I catch myself going, I am hoping he does not get caught by the DEA while he is grinding up bodies in the back room. So, <laughs> and what does that say about me? Yes, <laughs> and our society. So yes, I think uh, a recognition about the importance of mental health and healthier, open dialogue. Let's start truly getting rid of the stigma around mental health. And you know, we've seen that a lot in our family as my son has spoken out. And to be quite candid, Rod has paid a high price for being very vulnerable and open about his mental health issues. So that needs to shift. It needs to shift. And I just saw a recent story around the challenge for young men because they've been sort of put into this, you know, this gray area of limbo yes. and not understanding and feeling confident in the way in which they should be interacting with, um, with girls and women um, and those in their community because they've they have sort of a natural response that is being stunted. So it is a very complex issue. I'm, I want to ask you something, Cindy. This is something that is um, I've observed for years, and I'm very curious. And I think it, I do think that there are some origins here in negotiation. I love your perspective on this. When we think about female relationships, whether they are in business or they are at the soccer fields or the swimming pool, I find it interesting that if there's a strong woman that's present, it is almost as if she then has to alter her personality yeah. to fit in with the group of women that maybe don't feel as confident yeah. in negotiation. And I don't understand this sort of cannibalizing um, <laughs> within the female community, but yes. I, I know there are countless books um, about it, but it does feel like it's a little bit about that negotiation because when they, when sort of the, the women, and I'm making broad statements and I'm doing that hopefully in a respectful manner, but that you when are. they observe or a strong woman enters that group, um, it, it's almost like they they struggle to know how to negotiate even the friendship, yeah, right? That yeah. relationship that they might have. And I'm just perplexed. And maybe that's just my male brain. Um, but I want to also know because I do have a very strong nine-year-old girl. 
you yeah. know, and I want to make sure I support her in the ways in which she understands where her personality, how it fits, where, you know, sort of all of those elements. Yeah. And these are incredibly insightful questions, I must say, right out of the gate. And uh, and you're hitting on some really core points that aren't getting discussed very much, or at least not in healthy ways, because you're right. And I love the word cannibalize. I, I mean, I was kind of chuckling to myself because that that was a perfect description of what it feels like to be on the receiving end of that um, often. Uh, and I think there are a whole bunch of things at play here. One is um, a scarcity mindset and being able to switch over to a more abundant mindset. And to be fair to those women who do some of that sort of cannibalizing, because I, I think we are sadly still seeing some of that. I, I'm hoping it's shifting. I'm seeing some shifts. Um, but I think part of that comes from, if you look in the scheme of history, it isn't that long ago that women didn't have the right to vote, to mm -hmm. hold credit or a property in their own name. Uh, we weren't even recognized as persons in the eyes of the law in, in many jurisdictions. So it's perhaps not a surprise that we have that scarcity mindset, a lot of money baggage, uh, a lot of uh, feeling less than when you're when you're not recognized as a person legally. Of course, there's going to be some consequences to that. And then you layer onto that the kind of conditioning we get, you know, in kindergarten. Young boys, if you think about it, Rod, they get their social status by making themselves larger than life from that very young age. And by contrast, young girls in kindergarten get socially shunned if they try to make themselves too big. So that conditioning starts very early. So, so that's the backdrop, I guess, to what I'm, I'm going to say, which is also that when you come from that scarcity mindset, women will compete with each other because they believe they're competing for very limited space. And then you get women who've been conditioned to play nice, be gentle. And all of a sudden you have this woman who shows up who's self-assured and speaks her mind and is not afraid to sort of take charge and take up space, both physically and emotionally. And we get a lot of pushback from other women. And you'll see this often, not just when women interact, but in boardrooms, I have seen it over and over again in business communities or at parent council. If you have a strong female who speaks up, particularly if she's speaking up to a, a male, the other women will often prop up the male, the very same male that they've just been complaining about prior to that, but they will prop up the male because they are uncomfortable seeing a strong female take someone to task. And the last thing I'll say on that, that needs to change. A lot of experts out there, whether women's empowerment experts, but in particular business coaching experts, and even some negotiation coaches, tell women that they should modify their behavior to be accepted in the business world. And I profoundly disagree with that. I think nothing, in the same way that we were saying about mental health, if we don't start talking openly and vulnerably uh, and honestly about mental health, things will not change. And similarly, if women continue to get coached, that they need to modify their behavior and show up as softer, gentler, a little more timid versions of themselves propping up others around them, then nothing's going to change. So I think it, regardless of gender, own who you are, that natural style, whatever that is for you, and lean into those skills that for so long we've been told are a weakness in the business community. And then you layer on top of that, and I'll speak for the U.S., not Canada, um, sadly, that th we add this layer of sort of that there's an either or. And because we're not, I think, supporting um, negotiation and this interaction of sort of freedom of agency and the development of that without fear of consequence, yeah. or um, is that now we're in a world here where it's either you're on one side of the table or you're on the other side of the table. And so you, <laughs> so now the topic is incredibly heavy. And we haven't really supported the growth and development of skills that would allow for a conversation amongst friends where, yeah. you know, I have many male relationships where we have very different opinions, whether politically, socially, yeah. but we can maintain that friendship. We can even sort of get boisterous about our positions, yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't penetrate into the friendship in a way that says this friendship is at, is at risk. And I personally have seen too many women that have had to make real, I think, significant choices personally yeah. on the friends and the communities that they're a part of because that part of it is is either not there or it hasn't been allowed to sort of breathe like opening a, a bottle of wine like yeah. let it let the air right sort of do its magic headroom is produced by old soul a one-stop marketing agency that understands the power of brand and nuance reach out to my guy matt at old soul and supercharge your brand and content strategy that's old soul Shoot Matt a note at aoldsoul.com. That's A-O-L-D-S-O-U-L.com. And now, back to our guest.
And I think we're seeing some shifts there. I mean, I, I alluded to COVID I so. earlier and and where, I mean, I, it's unfortunate how it came about, I think, but it, I'll, I'll take the win, if you will. <laughs> but it, you heard a lot of people talking during COVID about how countries that had female leaders, like, you know, New Zealand, Germany, say, were faring better, and they were attributing it to that gender issue. And I don't know whether that's true or not. And frankly, I don't get into the muck about that. But as I say, I do think for the first time, certainly in my history, that we started looking at those traits, those so-called feminine traits, as being leadership skills. And now we are seeing that sort of ripple over into the business community, into our education systems, where we are starting to value and hold up with value those traits that previously we were really dismissive of. And I think some of it comes back to, like at its core, the thing that really got me launched on this mission um, is, is this idea that we have been conditioned to equate success based on a very competitive model, a, mo a model that is typically seen as more masculine. And again, we are moving away from gender attributions. I think that's a good thing. I, I think we got a long way to go still. Um, but certainly there have been studies that have done where they look at a, a bunch of traits. They've done it to you know, 60 different countries and 60,000 people and ask them to attribute whether particular traits are masculine, feminine, or neutral. And surprisingly, there's really high consistency about what traits people view as either masculine or feminine. And if we keep seeing that more competitive model as the only path to success, then it's not surprising that we're going to get the kind of polarity that we're seeing, that kind of polarization that we're seeing in the US in particular, but I would say today across the world, globally, we're seeing that. And part of it comes back, we do not listen and we're looking for the win. If we see negotiation as a win-lose proposition rather than a, and I hate when people say win-win because most people, when they talk about win-win, they talk about splitting the baby. You know, I want X, you want Y, either you get X or I get Y, or we find some compromise in between. I even hear really skilled mediators say, I know I've done my job well, when everybody walks away unhappy. I'm like, no, good <laughs> grief. That cannot be the test. It's, I come thinking I want X, you want Y. And I come with absolute empathy and curiosity. And I call the art of fascination, truly seeking to understand and meet your needs, if at all possible. Then we come up with solutions that are better than X or Y, Rod. And, and that's been the missing piece that I'm hoping we're sh gonna shift into. Cindy, I want you to paint the picture for me, if you don't mind, like sort of walk me into the coffee shop or your office or when you're speaking and you and you hand your book to a female professional. Yeah. Because to me, it's one of these revealing, it has, a, it has the potential to be a revealing moment for an individual, a man or woman in this manner that says, if I start to read this book and I start to go through this, I'm going to learn about myself, right? I'm going to learn about ways in which to engage maybe in a different way that feels more authentic to me. But it can also reveal the things that I, in essence, haven't maybe been employing. And that sometimes can be the thing that keeps people from seeking, you know, sort of uh, extended knowledge opportunities yeah. and learning and these sorts of things. So what is it like? I would just imagine it's not, it doesn't have to be something that's said, but a look, sort of a glance that someone has that, you know, they want to read it. <laughs> You know, they, yeah. Right. And, and But they also know that it's it could be a little bit of a Pandora's box. And sometimes we're yeah. depending upon the day and the situation that may that may challenge us. And I'm just curious as to that experience yeah. that you have as the author, as a passionate yeah. professional that is extending yourself to help others. Just yeah. that exchange. Yeah, you have a beautiful way of expressing yourself, by the way. I love how oh, you frame you. your questions. Um, yeah. And I would say for me. I find it, typically the engagement will come mostly at the what I call the extremes, right? Because because of all the conditioning we've been talking about and that kind of expectation um, and our belief system, our flawed belief systems about what it means to be successful in negotiation and business and beyond. What ends up happening often with women in particular is either at one end, they shy away, right? They shy away from negotiating or stepping into their power, whatever you want to call it, because they're afraid of the conflict. And we can talk more about conflict in a bit, because that that also, we need to reframe how we look at conflict. But they're going to, so I catch when you say that I or that, I know I'm going to be able to have a, a meaningful connection with somebody who has probably spent a lifetime sort of shying away from stepping into their power because they want to avoid conflict. But equally, interestingly, at the other end of the spectrum, I'm typically pretty confident I'm going to be able to have a meaningful connection with what I call the overcompensator. 
And I don't mean that pejoratively because goodness knows I was guilty of it. You know, <laughs> I started law school as a fresh faced 20 something coming, you know, right out uh, into the world and looked around and most of it back again, I'm dating myself in law. I was almost always the only woman in the room. You know, my clients were predominantly male. The adjudicators were predominantly male. Certainly the uh, other um, side were predominantly male. And very quickly, all of that conditioning came in. I'm like, I'm not going to get taken seriously unless I get scrappier, right? Because that's what we believe makes a great negotiator. The person who's talking the loudest and longest, the, you know, the person that's who's right, going, Cindy. going through the wind. <laughs> and so um, I know I'm going to have that. My clients called me the Barracuda, which they meant as a compliment, which speaks volumes. And until I had my epiphany, I showed up that way and believed I was being successful. And so I think that look, as you say, that understanding that passes is easiest at both ends of the spectrum. Where it is a little bit more challenging sometimes is the middle ground where they've probably not even thought of it before or don't consider where they are on the spectrum. And that takes a little bit more discussion, I think, to to open the open the door. Transitioning from the Barracuda, I'm using your word, <laughs> uh, to where you are now as an author and speaker and, yeah. and all the different ways in which you're helping to support uh, professionals, both men and women. Was there a watershed moment for you that said, yeah, that worked for me, yeah. but I, there's a, there's a different door that I need to go down and I need to apply it not just to myself, but I need to give back. Yeah, I would say there were a series of watershed moments in the interest of time, I won't take you through all of them. But it, I think as often happens when we're making a big transition, we have an epiphany, but then we revert back to our old habits. And then we need another epiphany and we revert back to that deep seated, deep rooted sort of conditioning. So one of my first ones, I think, was um, my daughter, when she was born, got diagnosed at two months with a really serious heart defect. And I won't take you through, there's a whole story around, I speak on this often, because it's a beautiful sort of parable, if you will, about the art of negotiation. But I recognize and everything that could go wrong did. And we spent almost three months in the hospital in critical care with her every day being life or death decisions. And it wasn't until later that I recognized that wow, you would have thought if there was ever a time that I would have brought the Barracuda to the table, that would have been it when I was fighting for her life. But I didn't. It was like intuitively I reverted back to what were my nor more natural skill sets. I was building rapport, bringing empathy to the table with the doctors, the nurses, the administrators. I was being flexible. I was having to really tap into my intuition. So that epiphany came later. But in the moment, I recognized that I did not like the way my life had become so conflict driven, um, where everything, the stakes were always appeared to be so high, where everything seemed to be a fight. And I believed it, you know, it was almost to the point where there's a joke, like if you go to a hotel and they don't have your room, hide the children because Cindy's here, right? So <laughs> it's so one of the watersheds was that moment. But then there were a series of other ones where you know, it started affecting my professional relationships, then my personal relationships, and ultimately my sense of self. And, and the actual major transition for me was a very small moment in the scheme of things. I was having a discussion with my son. I thought we were having just a normal conversation, but I could see his frustration level growing and growing. And then at one point, he just sort of blew over. He's like, for God's sake, mom, does every conversation with you have to be an argument that you win? And I know it sounds corny, but it's like, I saw my heart get pulled out of my chest and shatter on the floor in front of me. And I thought, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to be this person. And that's when I really started digging and thinking back, wow, when I was in that natural intuitive place, I actually got better outcomes. You know, negotiation course I took in law school where I was back in my authentic self before I, I got the practice of law and felt like I needed to be scrappier. You know, I won virtually every simulated negotiation in the course that year. And I'm not saying that to brag, but because I was not coming from that place of competition, win, lose, I was totally about bringing empathy to the table, listening, uh, rapport building, building trust, all of those things which came naturally to me that I had suppressed. I want to learn more about your family and you growing up in particular and sort of the, the choice of a law career early on. Was there a sense of justice? Were you the young, you know, sort of first, second grader that if some, somebody took the glue stick or the scissors and it wasn't fair <laughs> that little Cindy would, <laughs> was going to alert the teacher? Um, I'm just curious as to where that came from, because I think 
we have the opportunity to identify and understand yeah. behaviors and actions and, and not for just sort of labeling at all, but yeah. for a deeper understanding and how we can support growth and development of people's yeah. authentic self. Yeah, that's a great question. I love that. Um, and yeah, de definitely my my roots accounted for my path. No question. You know, I grew up in a low rental apartment complex in a pretty what was considered a tough neighborhood. Uh, you know, we we talk about be, being born on the wrong side of the tracks. For us, there was a physical creek and it was being on the wrong side of the creek. Mm. <laughs> and so, um, and my dad was a factory worker. And I remember, oh my gosh, there were always fights about money. There was just never enough money. And uh, and it was such a struggle. But also one gift that, that you know, my dad in particular, I think, gave me that I wasn't aware of as a kid. It wasn't until much later in life was the gift of believing in my voice. Like we had very spirited discussions around our crappy little kitchen table growing up. And, you know, and my dad subtly, I wasn't aware of it at the time, but not only allowed, but really encouraged kind of vociferous debate back and to challenge him about his ideas and ideals as well. Um, my mom, much less so, um, you know, she would periodically weigh in, but certainly both myself, I think my dad wanted boys, you know, he used to teach inner city kids to box. He didn't teach us to, to box, but he did teach us to, to fight, I guess, if you will, uh, and believe in a sense of justice. So yes, as a young girl, I remember hearing about how the indigenous people were treated and I would literally feel like a fire in my belly uh, or about the miners and how they, you know, the, how many miners died. And again, it was always that fire in my belly anytime there was a sense of injustice. So yeah, definitely came from a really young age, Rod. Your, your, dad, <laughs> your dad sounds like a, a fascinating character. What do you think it was about? Because I get the sense that you are, I mean, you weren't boxing, but there's a boxer <laughs> mentality, right? And yeah. probably you needed to have it. Um, mm -hmm. But what does it say about him, you know, that I'm thinking, of course, with a paintbrush, that's Hollywood in that regard. But, you know, a, a a guy who's working in a factory that is living to your point on the, maybe on the wrong side or the less, you know, desirable yeah. side of the Creek um, yeah. <laughs> that he had enough wherewithal to say there can be an imprint that I can have on my children. Um, that is through communication. I mean, it, yeah. it just, you can see that sort of the roots as yeah. you describe that sort of yeah. taking shape and form uh, and germinating over time to where you've now become who you are today. Do you think back to what he, the choices he had to make to then provide that kind of opportunity for you? Yeah. And thank you for recognizing that. Cause my dad sadly died far too young. He he left us at only 52 years old. And um, I do attribute a lot of where I am to him and his teachings. And it's funny, he had no formal education. Like to be honest, right, I, I'm not sure my dad ever finished grade six formally. They just kind of kept bumping him ahead, but he read voraciously and he was probably the most insightful person that I have ever, still today, I, I've not, and even when we talked about that gender piece earlier, I remember my dad like decades and decades ago when I was young and, um, you know, talking about as the, you know, as they called it then the women's live movement. And you had mentioned earlier about young boys and the mental health as they struggle to sort of find their place and how to interact. And my dad called that like really early in the process. I remember my dad saying, as gender roles are starting to shift, and trust me, we're going to see these bigger and bigger shifts. And as women step up into, you know, more of their own power and powerful positions, we're going to see a lot of pushback, that pushback reflex, and be prepared for probably a generation or two of mass confusion as men struggle to find their role and their place anymore. And that that served to be very prophetic. I think we're seeing a lot of that now. So yeah. And I think my dad was very intentional about that. Like all of my, my dad was the guy who with any of my friends growing up was caught and I didn't recognize it at the time, but I think consciously building up their sense of self and their self-esteem. And, and when he died, many of them have come back and talked about that. The fact that he was such an pivotal change in their lives to be able to feel that they deserved, that they were enough and that they had a voice and that they could use their voice. So. Thanks you for know, asking. You're welcome. Um, when I think about a number of interviews that I've done, I, I always, I'll get the sense, whether I'm in person or we're doing it over the Zoom or microphones, that there's a, a, a relative level of angst that that individual has for something that they want to pursue or achieve or that they haven't yet cracked the code on. Uh, yeah. I get this sense from you that there's a great, there's a great sense of peace with where you are 
because you have put the pieces of your history together in a way that makes sense and it's around story and that's allowing you to really enjoy this part of your career. Um, would you say that you feel maybe more in alignment with what you are doing and who you are, your own self-constitution than maybe any other point in your career? Uh, and I love the word th that you use the word peace because that is exactly what I would describe. I think I was lacking peace. I fought as a social justice attorney and I, you know, I think I affected great change, but there was a high cost that came from that approach. And there is no question I am at a greater peace right now and ironically getting better outcomes. But this big surprise for me, I would say, and, and I think for my clients, the biggest surprise, most people come for the business, right? They want more money, more respect, better positions. But I think the biggest surprise for them and for me has been the impact of being more intentional about how we negotiate in my personal life. And that same son who was my epiphany moment is also the one who got diagnosed with a serious mental health issue. And he was actually hospitalized early in COVID. So it, it was it was a nightmare. And I was in a very reactive mode at that. At that, Obviously, it was so sure. emotional. And, and then I, I partway through, I, I, I thought, I'm not practicing what I preach here. And I was able to apply some of the, the models that I teach now to go, OK, Cindy, check in with your own fear, your own ego, those things that you're too attached to, what you're being reactive about. You know, I call it no fear, F-E-A-R, fear, ego, attachment, reactivity. And then think about the other person. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been making this all about me and defending myself to him so that he knows that I love him. And I was able to show up from that place of recognizing his fear and how his ego had taken such a shot and the things that he was attached to for the way his life was going to look and how that was likely going to be very different now. And at first he didn't trust it as often happens. And again, for your listeners out there, if you embrace this but and and choose to show up differently right looking for power with rather than power over and show up leaning into those some of those skills we've talked about those so-called soft skills at first there'll be resistance because people won't trust it yet but i gotta tell you rod as when i just kept coming from that place of curiosity and empathy and compassion and building that trust with him his whole body there was such a physical softening and it had profoundly changed that relationship. It's changed my relationship with all of my kids, with my intimate partner, with my friends, with everybody in my life. There is definitely more peace, more control, not control over others, but looking for um, controlling how do we react? What do I want to experience in this moment? What, and it's been a beautiful shift. I love what you just said there. It's about, it, it's that whole that the concept, I should say, around negotiation that we think we know what it means, but really yeah. it's it's negotiating with oneself so that we don't walk away from a situation with regret because we didn't communicate our authenticity, our, yeah. our needs, right? The value and maybe where yeah. we are because we're in fear that we're going to be um, just sort of put down in a very rudimentary uh, yeah. term that I'm using there. But I, I want let, let's I want to close with this, Cindy. I want people to understand sort of who is the and I'm saying this, giving you sort of broad strokes here, broad opportunity, because yeah. <laughs> I think it's important around the book. Who should be thinking ab about the book? Because I think about the book in a way that applies to not just women, not just to a certain age group or professional in a certain setting at all. Um, because where we are, we talked earlier about AI and these sorts of things. Look, the next generation is going to be forced to think about a very different skill set that they're going to have to develop. And yeah. it's going to have to be within yeah. because you know, it, everything else will be done for us in ways we've yes. never been able to think about. And yes. so we better get good at negotiating our own personalities or our own sense of self in a way that we can operate in really healthy ways so that we can determine the best op, uh, environment or partner or situation or where we want to live. So talk yeah. just a little bit as we close where one people can go to learn more about your work, get the book, um, but also who would be ideal for this for this book? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, well, where people can go, I mean, my I, I would refer people to a, a secret resource for your listeners here. Usually it's only for people who, who bought the book. Yeah. But if they go to artoffemininenegotiationbook.com, it's actually a package of stuff that I, I put together for people who bought the book. Right at the beginning of the book, it's like, hey, if you want further resources, there's access to some videos and um, and some ebooks and uh, workbooks that people can work through. So even if they don't get the book, I would definitely encourage people take advantage of that. Go check out that artoffemininenegotiationbook.com, grab, take advantage of those additional resources. And in answer to who could benefit, 
you know, I'd mentioned earlier about agonizing over the use of the word feminine. And I also agonized over the use of um, or whether I was going to make the book universal or just write the book more for women talking about some of the conditioning that causes women to be further behind the eight ball. And I did end up opting for that. But this book would, I believe, benefit everybody. And, and it's something that I hope, as I say, they start teaching in elementary school um, because it if you accept that all of life is a negotiation or you're open to at least the possibility that all of life is a negotiation, who can't benefit from um, negotiating your mindset more powerfully, being taking control back over your life in terms of who you want to show up as, what do you want to experience in every moment? What do you want your relationships to look like? And as you learn, so the book's a nice combination, I think, of looking at some of the conditioning that has led us to where we are for both men and women. We talk about unconscious gender bias, but men also, young boys from a very early age are put in boxes and expectations labeled on them. So I I think if you look at the global conflicts today, the principles that I, I am hoping to, to sort of open more discussion on apply, whether it's for you negotiating your own mindset, you negotiating your personal uh, network and relationships, you in your business life, but also literally those same simple concepts will address and redress global conflict if we all open ourselves up to maybe reframing how we think about conflict uh, see it as an opportunity rather than the kind of dictionary definitions we see? What if we reframe power? What if we reframe what it means to show up as an exceptional negotiator? I think the world will be a different and a better place. Well, I find you to be incredibly powerful, and I mean that in the best sense of the Thank word, you. in a manner that you are allowing the transparency of your life, the good, the bad, the indifferent, right? That the, <laughs> you've experienced every emotion in life. And that you're applying that to to your work and the way in which you want to communicate to support the growth and development of others. And I think that's very, very important. We live in a, in a terribly synthetic world, and I find you incredibly authentic, yeah. and that's very important. Um, you can check out Cindy Watts. You can go to womenonpurpose.ca or alternatively, artoffemininenegotiation.com. And also you can go to artoffemininenegotiationbook.com as well uh, for some of those resources. But Cindy, what a great pleasure. Continued success. And I hope our paths cross again in the future. I'm your host, Dr. Rod Berger. Thanks for taking the plunge into Headroom, where we uncover the why behind the what and who impacting our lives. Headroom is a production of Rainlight and co-produced by our friends at Old Soul. I'm your host, Dr. Rod Berger, and this is Headroom. Headroom.